The story of astronomy is the story of mankind, it's our origins, it's how we came to be, how planet Earth came to be, and that's an important story. I think it's important for us to understand where we came from and where we're going. Microplastics are extremely small. They're very easily ingestible. There are also a lot of really important environments that are highly contaminated, and this could lead to uptake by plants and be a yet another exposure pathway. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Podker. When celluloid was developed as the first commercial plastic in the 1860s, the goal was to create an alternative to ivory. The popularity of ivory in manufacturing resulted in the loss of 25 million elephants from 1800 to 1989. But the inventors of plastic couldn't have known how far the field would go and how ubiquitous plastics would become. Plastic debris today can be found in all corners of the world, and a subset of these environmental contaminants, smaller than a sesame seed, is called microplastics, and an even smaller size subset of those are called nanoplastics. These persistent micro and nanoscale plastics have found their way into animals, our food supply, and even people. We are joined by Lauren Pincus, an environmental chemist and postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University, who's researching plastic degradation and how it interacts with inorganic materials in the environment. Dr. Pincus, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Very pleased to be here today. Can you tell us how microplastics and nanoplastics are introduced to the environment for people that aren't really aware of what we're talking about? Of course. Um, I would say that for starters, um, you know, one thing that is interesting about microplastics um, and nanoplastics, as you say, this is certainly a relatively new field that we are studying within the realm of environmental chemistry, uh, environmental engineering. And so, for example, even when it comes to our definition of what a microplastic is, we're not fully committed yet to a, an, a specific size definition. I'd say that the most common definition that you'll see, for example, like the EPA, will say that microplastics are plastics that are around less than five millimeters in size. And nanoplastics will be ones that are less than a, a micron in size. In terms of microplastics, we generally define them into two main categories, uh, primary and secondary microplastics. So primary microplastics would be plastics that are already uh, micro-sized as they enter into the environment. The famous example of this would be those exfoliating scrubs that you can use like right. facial scrubs. And so those already contain those tiny uh, microplastic particles. Right. And I think I, I heard one last night that uh, in, in the UK, I believe they just banned some a glitter product that had something similar in it. Yes, there's definitely been, you know, regulations uh, around these microbead scrubs. The secondary microplastics are larger pieces of plastic that enter into the environment. The famous examples of these being, you know, our single use plastics like plastic bags, plastic water bottles. Some other perhaps sort of less known sources of plastic would be sort of wear of products that we use every day. So for example, our tires um, will release a lot of microplastics as they wear against the road. Mm. Also the, the fabric. Um, a lot of our fabrics that we use are textiles that are um, made of plastics. And so as we wash our clothing, um, it will release a lot of plastics as well. So moving into your work a little bit, uh, one of the issues you're looking at is organic pollutants mixed in and inorganic pollutants. Can you tell us a little bit about how those are related to microplastics? Absolutely. The plastics themselves are certainly a concern um, as they get ingested by organisms. The research that we're looking into is the interaction, essentially a secondary effect that only increases the concern around plastics, which is that the plastics, in addition to being harmful on their own, could also be accumulating toxic organic and inorganic contaminants. I would say that our initial focus as a scientific community was mainly centered around organic contaminants. Some examples of this would be um, things like pesticides. Naturally, organic contaminants and plastics have a very similar chemistry. They're both very hydrophobic. They don't like water. And so there's a natural attractive force that we call the hydrophobic force that would draw organic contaminants like pesticides, to the surface of plastics and make it very easily for these organic contaminants to accumulate on a plastic surface. And we're concerned about that because 
Microplastics are, are extremely small. They're very easily ingestible by organisms. And so you can think of these plastics as being a vector to transport things like pesticides into organisms where they can then bioaccumulate, biomagnify up the food chain. I would say that more recently, attention's been focused on interactions between toxic metals and plastics. Heavy metals are an inorganic contaminant. So um, they have a very different chemistry than an organic contaminant. Rather than being hydrophobic, so not liking water, inorganic contaminants are hydrophilic. Um, so they easily dissolve in water. And so it was initially thought that plastic, since they're so hydrophobic, wouldn't be attractive to heavy metals. However, what we found that as is that as plastics enter into the environment and they degrade, they can actually change a lot in terms of their surface chemistry. And one of the main changes that occurs is in terms of the surface charge of the plastics. Essentially, as plastics are exposed to things like sunlight, UV light, and so what this does it, is it introduces a lot of oxygen-containing functional groups onto the plastic surface, and so this makes it much more attractive for things like toxic heavy metals to now accumulate on the plastic surface. We're talking about metals that have essentially dissolved in like water. Like, yes. you, you, like your, your research with this has mostly been in, in an aqua environment, correct? So actually, um, I would say that some of my research has focused on terrestrial environments and some has been in aqueous environments. There are also a lot of really important terrestrial environments that are highly contaminated with microplastics. This has been a much less studied field. An example of this would certainly be um, that in a lot of our agricultural uh, processes, we use a large amount of plastic products, um, for example, like plastic greenhouse sheeting. And so there are very uh, easy pathways by which we can be incorporating microplastics into our agricultural soils. And this could lead to uptake by plants and be a yet another exposure pathway. So you mentioned the sunlight. Can you talk about some of the different environmental conditions that impact the plastic degradation? Absolutely. What is the influence of different environmental conditions on how different types of plastic degrade? Certainly, our environment is extremely uh, complex and extremely diverse and heterogeneous. Um, so in the research that I've been conducting, we had three field sites, and these varied mainly as a function of salinity. So I had um, a coastal environment site, one that was like a brackish saltwater marsh, and then a freshwater lake. Um, and we also had some samples as well at each of these sites that were on land versus in the water. And so what we were looking to see is, based on the different environments that these plastics were placed into, would that have an effect on, for example, the rate at which the plastics degrade, as well as perhaps the type of degradation that they undergo. Can you tell me about what the plastics you were testing? Can you talk a little bit about the actual process, I guess? What were you putting in the environments? You know, the goal of this research was really to conduct an experiment that contained an aspect of field work as well as laboratory uh, work and to really try to bridge that gap. And so it was very important to me to be able to study the weathering processes of plastics in a controlled way. We designed samplers that would essentially hold the plastics in place and so they can weather surrounded by the natural environment um, but not be released. From a chemical perspective, these plastics also have um, some key differences in terms of their chemical structure that it would be interesting to see if their starting chemical structure would have any effect on the degradation pathway as well. We've talked to a couple of people that are working on ways to kind of collect the microplastics out of the environment. Is there anything about these techniques for remediation that you find interesting? We're really focused on doing a bit more observational work at this point, um, essentially understanding how our current generation of plastics degrades in the environment first to help to um, inform the types of remediation techniques that would be most effective. And then also in terms of intervening in the design phase of our next generation of plastics. So we're currently rethinking the types of plastics uh, that we want to be using in our day-to-day -day lives. And I would argue that in order to essentially 
avoid making the same mistakes twice, if you will, we really need to fully understand how our current generation of plastics is degrading in the environment. I certainly believe in having a very tailored approach to remediation. So we were talking about, for example, um, plastics can be in terrestrial environments versus aqueous environments, certainly environments of varying chemistries. And so you'll need different remediation strategies. For example, if the plastics are in soil versus in water, also depending on the types of plastics, perhaps, as well as their size, their nanoplastics versus macroplastics. Um, and so my general approach to remediation is, first of all, the best thing that you can do is prevent that pollution from being uh, introduced into the environment in the first place. Controlling our usage of plastics is the most important thing we can do. But once it's into the, in the environment, we really need to have a tailored solution depending on the environment that these plastics are in. A lot of people at this point are recycling the, the, the big pieces of plastic or trying to, whether... Mm -hmm their facilities can do it or not as different. So, <laughs> but um, what can the average person do to keep plastics from getting in the environment or being in a state where they can be microplastics? Is there steps you could take beyond recycling? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, I think that the thing that's perhaps most exciting to me about uh, conducting research in this area is the amount of societal concern that the public has about the issue of microplastics. You know, I think that this is an issue that really touches people that they're really concerned about in terms of our environmental health and people's health. Um, and so I think that it's great that people have this level of interest and concern. Really, the most important thing that we can do is to control our usage of plastics. As a society, we really need to think about when we're using plastic products and when that could instead be replaced by either um, one of these new second generation plastics, a bioplastic, something that degrades more easily, more rapidly, or a non-plastic product. The more that we can certainly control our usage of single use plastics, that is essential. So um, reuse, use your reusable grocery bags, try to use reusable straws. Special thanks to Lauren Pincus for the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.